In my last video, I introduced the enemy. In order to understand religion in this world, you need to understand him because he created all the confusion. He needed to be discussed because of where the rest of the story goes. This next subject, King Solomon, is in the middle of the pack because while he is a great testament to Elohim and Israel in the beginning of his story, in the end of his story, Satan uses his mistakes a great deal to create doctrine for his story. If you do research on your own on this subject, you must be very careful because there's pure wickedness surrounding it and could be a stumbling block for those not fully grounded in their faith. But if it's not covered and understood, it can be a cause for loss of faith if you come across the enemy side. So I've been praying for guidance from the Holy Spirit to communicate this to you that it fills you with understanding and removes confusion. Let's begin. Before part five, we left off with Solomon becoming the next king of Israel after his father, King David. David secured a peaceful situation for Solomon. He defeated all of Israel's enemies so that when Solomon came to the throne, there was no one left to fight. This was also why David was not able to build a temple. He told Solomon, my son, it was in my mind to build a house unto Elohim. But Elohim came to me and said, you have shed blood abundantly and made great wars. You shall not build a house unto my name. You have shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. A son shall be born to you, who shall be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all his enemies round about. For his name shall be Solomon. And I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son. And I will be his father. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. So my son, I have prepared for the house of the Lord a hundred thousand talents of gold and a thousand talents of silver and of brass and iron without weight, for it is an abundance. Timber also and stone have I prepared. Then David gave Solomon the plans for the temple that he had by the Spirit. The temple was to be a house for Elohim, a holy place in which the Ark of the Covenant would be held and where burnt offerings would be done. Like he told Solomon, David made preparations for the temple before his death. He gathered the strangers that were in the land of Israel, but not actually of Israel. He had them gather stones to build the house. He prepared iron for the nails and brass and cedar trees in the abundance. David took care of much of the preparations, being wise in knowing that Solomon was young and inexperienced. And the house that was to be built for Elohim must be exceedingly magnificent, a faming of glory throughout all countries. So he did much of the beginning groundwork. David was a good king. His reign over Israel was for a total of 40 years. From this, Solomon's kingdom was firmly established. So Solomon was now king. Elohim appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. Elohim asked Solomon, What shall I give you? Solomon told Elohim, You've shown great mercy to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne, as it is this day. Now, Elohim, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? This pleased Elohim. He told Solomon, Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked for, both riches and honor so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. So Solomon became the wisest king on earth. An example of his wisdom was when two women appeared before him, each carrying a child, one living, the other dead. One woman accused the other woman of stealing her child after hers died, and the other denied doing so. Solomon, in his wisdom, ordered the living child to be cut in halves with the sword to be equally given to both women. The problem solved itself 
as the mother that accused the woman of taking her child said, No, just let her keep the living child. Do not slay it. And the accused woman said, That's fine. Divide it. Solomon gave the child to the right mother, who actually cared. All of Israel heard of the judgment that Solomon had judged, and they feared him because they saw Elohim's wisdom was in him to do judgment. Solomon reigned over all of Israel. In the fourth year of his reign as king, he began the work of building the temple as a house for Elohim. Chapters 5, 6, and 7 of 1 Kings describes this in detail. Solomon selected over 150,000 men to do work for the building of the temple. He sent word to Haram, king of Tyre. He said, As you have dealt with David, my father, and sent him cedars to build himself a house to dwell in, so deal with me. Behold, I'm building a temple for Elohim to dedicate it to him. And the temple which I build will be great, for Elohim is greater than all gods. Therefore, send me at once a man skillful to work in gold and silver, and bronze and iron, and purple and crimson and blue, who has skill to engrave with the skillful men who are with me in Judah and Jerusalem, who David, my father, provided. Huram answered back in writing, saying, Because Elohim loves his people, he has made you king over them. Blessed be Elohim, who made heaven and earth, for he has given King David a wise son, endowed with prudence and understanding, who will build a temple for Elohim and a royal house for himself. And now I have sent a skillful man, endowed with understanding, Hiram, my master craftsman, the son of a woman of the daughters of Dan, and his father was a man of Tyre, skilled to work in gold and silver, bronze and iron, stone and wood, purple and blue, fine linen and crimson, and to make any engraving and to accomplish any plan which may be given to him with your skillful men and with the skillful men of David your father. The man he sent was Hiram Abif. He was a master mason and his story is a central core and inspiration for Freemasonry. I will get into it later in the video. But the building of the temple was massive. You can read about how glorious it was in 2 Chronicles chapter 3. At the end of construction, Solomon assembled the leaders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes in Jerusalem, and they brought the Ark of the Covenant from the city of David to the temple. The Levites brought up the Ark and all the holy furnishings. Then all the congregation of Israel who were there did the sacrifices of sheep and oxen and a great multitude. The priests brought the Ark of the Covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple to the most holy place. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and sacrifices, and the glory of Elohim filled the temple. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and saw the glory of Elohim in the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and praised Elohim, all saying, For he is good, and his mercy endures forever. It took 20 years, but Solomon finished the house of Elohim and successfully accomplished all that came into his heart. This was a remarkable accomplishment, and just reading this, you can feel the Holy Spirit leaping for joy in your heart. It's truly remarkable. You can read it for yourself in 2 Chronicles chapters 5-8. through 8. So Solomon is now older, and from this temple he built, he built an astonishment for the rest of the world. Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. All the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which Elohim had put in his heart. Remember, Elohim promised this. Solomon made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones. He had a massive amount of gold items. He was truly a splendor. So it was at this time of his splendor where he made his mistakes. His biggest mistake was he loved women. Any man listening to this should learn from Solomon. He loved many foreign women, one of them including the daughter of the Pharaoh of Egypt. Earlier, he made a treaty with the Pharaoh of Egypt and married the Pharaoh's daughter. He was not supposed to do this. He didn't need a treaty. Elohim was to be Israel's protection. He would fight for them. But as his status of splendor grew, he took on more wives and concubines. Women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, the Sidonians, and the Hittites. He took wives from these nations of whom Elohim had said to the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, and neither shall they come into you. For surely they will turn your heart after their gods. But Solomon's flesh was weak. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. These wives turned Solomon's heart away from Elohim. His heart was not loyal to Elohim as was the heart of his father David. He went after the gods and goddesses of these other nations, like Ashtoreth of the Sidonians. Ashtoreth was the name of the moon goddess of the Sidonians or Phoenicians. 
Don't forget about the pagan structure, in case you didn't understand who Asherah was every time you heard Israel turn to her and Baal. So anyway, Solomon did evil on the side of Elohim. He built high places to worship Chemosh, the abomination of the Moabites, and to Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. He did this other times for all his wives, who burned incest and sacrificed to their gods. So Elohim told Solomon, Because you have done this, and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Elohim then raised up adversity against Solomon. And this is the end of the story for Solomon. He reigned over Israel for 40 years. And in his end, the kingdom of Israel fell apart. The Bible doesn't really speak in depth about the last years of Solomon. You can read and learn from his wisdom in the book of Proverbs. The book of Ecclesiastes is said to be written by him. It is a book that speaks on his remorsefulness and desire to be right with Elohim again. It was said to be written towards the end of his life. His story is not a happy ending. With Solomon's death expire the glory and power of ancient Israel. And though the scriptures do not go in depth on his level of disobedience and wickedness, it can be inferred that he did a great deal of wickedness based on how the enemy has tried to use him for his doctrine to build his kingdom. This is known specifically through Freemasonry and the occult. The occult world highly references King Solomon. I'm not claiming their beliefs as true or not, but I think it's important to understand the other side. Like I said in part five, know your enemy. The occult world refers to Solomon as a skilled sorcerer. It's not that he only tolerated paganism, but also participated in it. According to one of the many legends about him, Solomon used pagan magic to imprison 72 rebellious evil kings in a brass vessel, throwing them into a lake where they were supposed to stay until the end of time. The legend also says that in an attempt to find great treasure, the Babylonians rescued the vessel and broke it open, allowing the demons to escape. These demons became known as the 72 spirits of Solomon. Among the Eastern nations is again esteemed as a great magician who had great power over the spirit world. It was said he gained this power from Satan who gave him a ring of power with a symbol on the ring. This symbol is known as the Seal of Solomon, also known as the Star of David. The Seal of Solomon is a hexagram and hides complex meanings, but it is a symbol used highly in witchcraft. The symbol was supposedly used on Solomon's ring and gave him the power to understand and communicate with animals and to conjure up spirits to do his bidding. Kabbalists and alchemists are very fond of this symbol. It is also hidden on the U.S. dollar. The way it is used today to represent the nation of Israel is very occultic in nature. It is not a symbol of Elohim. In reference to Freemasonry, according to the Freemason Dictionary, the Temple of Solomon plays a very important part. It is said in Freemasonry that Solomon, Huram, King of Tyre, and Hiram Abith resided as Grand Masters over the lodges which they established. It's said their symbolic degrees were instituted and their systems of initiation were invented and from that period to the present, Freemasonry has passed them down. It's said that almost all of symbolism of Freemasonry rests upon or is derived from the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. Each Masonic Lodge is and must be a symbol of the Jewish Temple. Each master in the chair represents King Solomon and every Freemason is a personation of the Jews who worked on this temple. That's why I did part five of this series before introducing this subject. It's important to understand that Satan wants to be like Elohim, so he must use the things of Elohim, but pervert them. This is why there will be an antichrist. I hope it starts connecting that Satan's primary goal is to pervert the things of Elohim. He's not just making up his own doctrine, but it must be a perversion of Elohim's. This is why the building of the third temple is so important to this new occult age. This is the goal of Freemasonry, and the events transpiring today are being orchestrated by these men within this structure of power. Freemasonry is not just an organization, it is a religion. But I will get into that later in more detail. The point of this knowledge is that from Solomon's mistake, the glory of ancient Israel went downhill, and Lucifer used Solomon's disobedience in creating and establishing his doctrine for future worship of him by his own name. Freemasonry and the occult all use Solomon as a symbol for the rebellion, particularly because of how great and important Solomon was. 
There is much confusion around Solomon, and my hope is that this part in the series answers some questions. This history is very important to understand. This is the last time you will hear of a united 12 tribes of Israel. In the next part of the series, we will learn about the division of the two kingdoms, Israel and Judah. Have you heard of the 10 lost tribes of Israel? This understanding will be coming up. I hope this sparks a desire for you to dig into Elohim's word and rebuke Satan at every turn. The goal of this series is for us not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. I hope that turns to be true for you. If you're not subscribed yet, please subscribe to get the notification of the next part of the series. Thanks for watching. If this blessed you, please share it with others. Have Bible studies around the topics and keep the discussion of Elohim's word going. Thank you for your support. I love you all.